I'd like to begin this morning in John 16. We have been talking about heaven on these few Sunday mornings that we've been gathering, discussing this. I want to continue it this morning. And I want to begin here in John 16. I'm going to read... Um, I'm going to read the passages in the King James, and then I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Bible. But I want us to see this in verse 32. John 16, verse 32. Jesus said to His disciples, Behold, the hour comes, yes, is now come, that you will be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now I want to read this out of the Amplified Bible. But take notice, the hour is coming, and it has arrived when you all will be dispersed and scattered, every man to his own home, leaving me alone, yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer, Take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. That's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful what Jesus says to his disciples here. And I want to talk to you about this this morning. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And I just pray that we would allow the Lord to minister to us all that He's done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is for us. You are to be of good cheer because of something that Jesus did. Well, verse 32 is um, the verse that describes us. It's our failure. That's what it describes. It's amazing that Jesus prophesies to these disciples. These are His closest people. These are the men that He is entrusting everything to. He is about to leave. He's about to be taken up to be crucified. And then he will entrust his whole ministry of all of the ages into the hands of these men. And he prophesies to them. And he tells them in so many words that you're all going to leave me. You're going to go back to your homes. You're going to leave me alone. Now that speaks of failure. That speaks of neglect It speaks of what is so common and so typical of man. That's all we can do. If we try to do anything in ourselves, we're going to fail God. Now, we might be faithful in many regards. We might do some mighty things. We might think of ourselves to be pretty great people because no doubt these disciples did as they're on their way in this night. They were debating who was the greatest among them, who was going to sit at Jesus' right hand. And no doubt, some of them presented their arguments as to why they're going to be there as Jesus' right-hand man, as it were. And so they had many moments of greatness, just like you and I will have many moments of greatness. But in the end, everything we are, everything we can ever achieve or accomplish will end in failure. That's what, that will be the testimony of the human life, our human life. Absolute failure. So Jesus speaks directly into the prophetic meaning of what these men are going to do and tells them, all of you are going to abandon me, your Savior, your friend, the Christ, the Son of God, that Peter, you've even said I am. You're all going to forsake me, abandon me, leave me alone, but I'm never alone. My Father's with me and you're going to fail. But verse 33 says very clearly, I am going to succeed. I am going to overcome the world. I'm going to do what you cannot do. And I'm going to do this for you. 
on your behalf. Because if you allow yourself to just realize what you are, your weakness, your inability, the frailty of human flesh, the impossibility of a fallen human to ever in his own power bring any pleasure to a holy God, it can only lead to frustration and depression. That's all we could ever have, looking into ourselves. But Jesus tells us very clearly, I want you to be of good cheer. I know what you're going to do, but I want you to be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. In this world, you're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations of all sorts, but I've overcome it. And I want to talk about this just a minute. The world that Jesus overcame. What does it mean? Because He did this for you. So what does it mean that He overcame? And there's several things that we understand from the Old and New Testament that describes the world. Now the world, as far as this worldly system, is very awful. God said that it is at enmity with Him. It's His enemy. And there is no compromise with it. There is no possible way that God can get along with this present world system. So John writes in his epistle, and he says, If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And he describes what this world system is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Alright, well it's impossible for that world system to have any type of relationship with God because they're set diametrically opposed to one another. Well you and I were in this world. This world was not simply our home. This world system is what governed us. We thought like it. We lusted like it. We had the pride of this world. We had the desires of this world. Everything. That's why you find that the only thing that humans who have fallen can ever achieve is failure. That's it. Because that's all we can attain to. And so Jesus comes into this world and He says, I have overcome it. Now up to this point, He speaks the truth. He has overcome the world. And He will go on to fully overcome the world and the world system. This just simply means many things. It means that Jesus overcame something that is passing away. The Bible says this world is passing away. We're talking about this world system. It is passing away. Jesus overcame it. That's good news for us because He is offering to us something that does not pass away. This world, everything in it is going to be burned up. Everything's going to be shaken. Everything's going to be judged. Everything in it is going to be destroyed. I flooded the earth with water in the past. I will judge this entire earth with fire in the future. This world is passing away, but I want you to be of good cheer. I've overcome this world. I've overcome that which passes away. And I offer you an eternal city, a city where there'll be no judgment. No fires, no floods, no judgment of God. I offer you something secure and eternal. That's why we should have good cheer. This world's passing away. He gives us His eternal home. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If this weren't the truth, then I wouldn't tell you this. But it is the truth, so believe in me, is what He said. He overcame the world. It speaks of the enmity that the world has for God. And the, and, and the judgment that God has for the world. This world is the enemy of God. Jesus overcame it. It is an enemy that aggressively attacks everything that has to do with God and His glory. The earth is filled today with the glory of Satan. Everywhere you go, you find the perversion of Satan, his philosophies, his theology, everything that Satan promotes is found everywhere in this world, all over this world, and Jesus overcame it. He overcame the glory of Satan, he overcame the glory of this world, and because he prevailed, this earth is going to be filled with the glory of God. Just as the waters cover the sea, the glory of God is going to fill the earth. So Jesus has done that. He is, he is taken from Satan this kingdom that he possessed. And Jesus now possesses it. Jesus overcame the pressures of this world. He overcame the way of life that is in this world. There's a way that seems right unto man. But in the end it leads to death. Well, I'm going to tell you, that way of life 
seems right to every man that has ever lived except one. One man, born of a virgin, stepped into this world and had the gumption and the reality and the wisdom to tell all humanity, you are wrong and you're headed in the wrong direction. There's a way that seems right unto man, but it didn't seem right to this man. He overcame that way, and He showed us that He is the way. Jesus didn't allow the world to squeeze Him into its mold. He was not conformed to this world. He always remained separated from it. He was born a heavenly man. He died a heavenly man. He was born righteous. He died righteous. He came from heaven. He went back to heaven. He's from above. He never became beneath. He was born holy. He died holy. The world chokes the Word of God out of people, but the world never choked the Word out of Jesus. He overcame it because He is the Word of God. The world causes us to live by stress and worry rather than by faith. But Jesus overcame the stress of the world. He overcame the worry of the world and He lived every moment of His life by faith. These are things that are very hard for me to consider. Because the Bible says that whatever's not of faith is sin. That's just what it says. Whatever's not of faith is sin. Well, that just simply tells me that from a, from a child all the way through his life to the very end, when he on the cross lifted his spirit into the hands of his father, he lived every second by faith. Every second. There was never a moment in Jesus' life when he was not a man of faith trusting in his Father. That speaks volumes to me because I could never do that. But he did it for me. That's exactly what he did for me. This world tries to make us feel safe because everybody's doing it. But Jesus didn't do what everybody was doing. He didn't fit in with the religious leaders of his day. He was occupied with one thing. Whatever my Father does, that's what I do. Whatever my Father says, that's what I'm going to say. And He overcame the peer pressure of this world. This world brings us into submission to Satan's will and His power. Jesus was tempted by this same devil to, to forsake His Father and to accept all of the tangible possessions that Satan wanted to give Him. Satan promised Him the kingdoms of the world if Jesus would worship Him. But Jesus overcame that devil and He said, I will worship only my Father. I will not receive one provision from you, Satan, even though I'm hungry and it is a physical desire in me to eat and you tell me to turn the stones into bread. I will never satisfy my physical life with your provisions. Man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he rebuked the devil and he overcame him. The world passes away. Jesus is forever. The Bible says the whole world lies in the embrace of the wicked one. But Jesus overcame his embrace. That's Satan. He overcame his embrace. And the Bible says that Satan came to Jesus and had nothing in him. There was nothing. He had no hold. He had no influence. He had no power over Jesus in any way. Not emotional, not physical, not spiritual. There was nothing that Satan could do to ever get a hold upon this one man. He totally overcame. So all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Jesus has fully and completely overcome it. So he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've overcome its judgment. I've overcome its hostility. I've overcome its power. I've overcome its prince. I've overcome its sin. I've overcome its death. I've overcome everything that's in this world. Everything the world can throw at you, I have prevailed against it, and I want you to have good cheer. Well, I want, if you would, please, I want you to follow with me through the book of Hebrews and I just want us to cover this just a little bit because you have to understand why we are to be of good cheer. How this comes to us. And it is the Word of God that must speak to us. In Hebrews chapter 4, I just want you to see all that Jesus is to every one of us. 
especially those of us that believe. So we're going to read through parts of Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have, and I just want you, if you will, if you do mark in your Bibles, which is fine to do, I would encourage you to just circle, we have. I want you to see that this is something that belongs to you. All right? Now, we know Jesus is the Son of God, and He offered a redemption to appease the wrath of God. And He bore for God the sin of this world so that the glory of God could fill the earth. But don't ever mistake that this Jesus died and lives for you. The Bible says it. You have to be able to say in your life, I have. I have something. I have somebody. And the Bible says it. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Well, He is our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Because you have this high priest, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now you can come to this place because He overcame this world for you. So you can come to God because you have a high priest. Now He tells us in chapter 6 verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope, and again, underscore it, circle it, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered into that within the veil. You have something. You got to get this. There are so many people in Christianity today, they don't have this. They don't. They have the theological understanding of it, but they don't have the reality of it. You're never going to have the experience of this good cheer. You're never going to have the confidence of this hope until you can say and know without a shadow of a doubt, I have somebody who has gone behind that veil into the presence of God on my behalf. I have, I have Him. Jesus is mine. I mean, you just got to know it. It's not saying it that's going to do it. You got to know it. And it's the Holy Ghost who makes that reality real to you. And I'll tell you, when that reality is real to you, then everything the world is trying to do to frustrate you, defeat you, overcome you, overpower you, cause you to live in sin, defeat, guilt, shame, whatever, it is going to do it every day of your life if there's not something within you, within your spirit that says, wait a minute, I have somebody. I don't have to live sick. I don't have to live depressed. I don't have to live in guilt. I don't have to live in defeat. I don't have to do what the devil tells me to do because I have somebody who has gone into the presence of God for me. I have him. And you got to know what it means that he's there. Why he's there for you. Now this hope, verse 19, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, it entered into that within the veil. How glorious. Well, chapter 7, verse 25, tells us what this means. Wherefore, because He's there for you, you have Him, wherefore He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever lives to make intercession for them. So you have Him, He's doing something for you. For such a high priest became us, He did this for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So he's able to save you to the uttermost. Well, I've found Christians who have become so defeated and so despair because after they became a Christian, 
They despaired from personal failure in their life. You understand what I'm talking about? Because every one of you in this room have dealt with it. You've dealt with falling into sin as a Christian. Well, you're very compassionate upon the pagans who don't know Jesus who fall into sin. And you understand and you have every confidence in the world to be able to preach a gospel of hope and mercy to them. Because they're without Christ and they're in sin and they're in the depths of sin or they're in the drugs of sin or whatever it may be. And you know that God will forgive them, but somehow it enters into you as a Christian that because you were a believer and you had an understanding of grace and you had the opportunity of God's power, but you chose to sin, you fell into sin, you, you, take, you took an act of rebellion against God, that now there's just nothing for you. Well, that to me speaks of the uttermost. I mean, uttermost is uttermost. And that just tells me that it means you try to describe an individual in your mind, in your imagination, that you think is so wicked, so defiled, so unholy, so far from God, whatever the knowledge is that they have of God, whatever they've done, whatever opportunities they've had, and you say that person is the uttermost. You may put your name on that person's life. Well, the Bible says he is able to save to the uttermost that person. If they'll come to God through Him. Because He lives forever to make intercession for them. That's what He does. And He doesn't have to make sacrifices all the time for His sins and others. He's done it once and for all. Once and for all. Because He ever lives, anybody that comes to the Father through Him will find the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Verse 8 says this, Now of these things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So this is it. I mean, everything that Hebrews has said up to this point. So you don't want to miss this. This is glorious. I mean, this is it. This is the sum of it. We have. Oh my God, how I long that every one of you in this room could say that with all faith and confidence. How I wish that you could say that, that I have. Because that's the sum of it. If you can't say that, you can't experience what the rest of this verse says. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's the sum of it, guys. That's it. We have a great high priest who sits on the right hand of God. He sits on the majesty of the throne of heaven. We have, I have, Lee Ship has in the presence of God a friend. He has a Savior. He has a Redeemer. He has an ever-living priest who is constantly on my behalf talking to God for me. Constantly. What does this afford me? What does it get me? Well, I just have to read it, though I taught about this not too long ago. Verse 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their minds, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That's the new covenant. In this new covenant, he says in verse 12, which is so glorious, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. This is what God is saying. Listen, I will be merciful. I will be kind. I will be tender-hearted. I will be gracious. I will be slow to anger. I will be quick to forgive. All of those who are unrighteous. To your unrighteousness, I will be merciful. Oh my God, how awesome that is. Unrighteousness, don't forget, is your violation of God's law. Your violation of God's holiness. Your violation of God's standards. Your violation of everything God intended. And God says, because of this new covenant, you have a high priest standing in my presence. You have fled to him as your refuge. He is your hope. You come in no other name. You come in no other means, no other way, but his blood. Then I will be pitiful, kind, slow to anger, merciful, gentle to your violation of my law, to your violation of my standards, to your failure to be what I wanted you to be, to do what I wanted you to do. I will be kind to you because you're coming through Him. Uh, that is absolutely wonderful. This is the sum of it. Everything. This is why we have good cheer. He tells us in this, at the end of this, and their iniquities 
will I remember no more. I will remember them no more. In chapter 9, verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained temporary redemption for us. Eternal redemption for us. My God, how powerful is the blood of Jesus. How powerful, eternal redemption for us. In chapter 10, he tells us in verse 9, Then said he, Jesus said, Lo, he's saying this to his father. Jesus said to his father, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that's the old covenant, that me, he may establish the second, that is the new covenant where God writes in our minds and our hearts and he's merciful to our unrighteousness. He won't remember our sins anymore. Jesus came so that the first could pass and the second could come and be here by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. Hallelujah. How awesome that is. Chapter 10 verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. In verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence which has great recompense of reward. There's going to be pressure to cast it away. There's going to be trials that make you want to give it up. There's going to be things in this world that are so hellish upon your life that you're going to think, is it worth it to press on in Christ? There's going to be personal failure on your part that Satan's going to tell you, you see, you just need to give up. You're not, you're not going to make it. You're not cut out for this. You tried. You did your best. It's just over for you. But if you read the book of Hebrews, you've got to understand this is not about you, it's about Him. And the only thing it's got to do with you is how you come and what you put your hope in and what your refuge is. And if you have nothing but Jesus, you have everything. Everything. If you've got Him. He is your high priest. He is yours. But you've got to be able to say He's mine. Too many people say, I've got religion. That'll get you to hell you got to have a priest in the presence of God for you who intercedes for you. It's not having a church. It's not having a confession. It's not having just some hope like the world has hope. You have to know He is there for me. Listen, this, these are some of the most wonderful words that you could ever read. We have. We have. You read through the book of Hebrews and just circle it every time you read it. We have. We have. We have redemption. We have hope. We have a high priest. We have a new covenant. We have mercy from God. We have life. We have. He did this for you. He did it for you. The Bible says in, 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 in the Gospels at the birth of Jesus, He says, not for unto God is a Savior born, but it says for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. God did this for you. I mean, we, in an attempt to be humble, we turn it into something that, that is a broken faith. Humility is to really understand how incredible is the love of God that He did something for me. And He didn't just do anything. He, he did His all. He gave His all. He gave His Son unto you. You have a Savior. You have a Redeemer. You have a God that knows everything about you and cares about everything with you. You have a God that has made absolutely every possible provision to get you to heaven. If you will just come through His Son. And if you'll just keep coming and don't throw your confidence away. But how tempted we are to throw our confidence away sometimes. Well, I've just failed God. I'm back in the altar again praying about the same thing. Well, then pray about it. Well, but you don't understand, Pastor. <clears throat> I told God last week I'd never do this again, and I did it three times this week. Get in that altar and come through the blood and through the name of Jesus Christ, and He'll be merciful to your unrighteousness. Come again. You can come. The danger is when you don't. And you take that confidence that you can have in Christ, and you just throw it away. Because you think this is not for me. This is for you. You have. You've got to know that you have this. 
Oh, it's just got to be in your life and in your spirit. In chapter 11, verse 13, he says this, speaking of the saints of the past, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but have seen them far off. They were persuaded of them. And that's the persuasion that I'm trying to tell you about. You have to know it's for you. And embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. They knew. They, they, didn't, they, don't know, they didn't know half of what you know. They didn't have the revelation that you have. They didn't have the word of God that you have. They didn't know a fraction of what you know. But they had promises from God. And those promises were so great to them that they believed, they were persuaded, they embraced them, they saw them, and they walked through this world confessing, I'm a stranger here, I'm a pilgrim here. And I believe with all of my heart, that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples in John 16, 32 and 33. You are a failure. You're going to neglect me. I'm your Savior, your God, your Lord. And every one of you are going to abandon me and leave me alone all by myself. But I'm not alone. My Father's with me. But you are failures. But I want you to not be depressed. I want you to have courage. I want you to be of good cheer. I'm going into the final conflict with this earth. I'm going face to face with the devil. I'm going to take your sins and I'm going to take everything that the devil can throw at me and I'm going to spoil his kingdom. I'm going to rob him of his power. I'm going to nail to my cross everything that kept you from God and I'm doing it for you. I know what you are, but I know what I am. And I'm doing it for you. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. This is what Jesus wants us to know. Well, there were people that were, I mean, they understood it. Oh God, they understood it. The Apostle Paul says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be far us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. For us. I mean, there it is again, for us. He did this for us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. You got this problem with a believer. You've got that problem with a believer. You've got this problem with somebody. You've got this problem. Who's going to condemn anybody if, listen, and it's a big if, but if God has justified them, I promise you all of your effort and all the devils will not condemn them. Who, if he's justified us? Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Ye, rather, he is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're killed all day. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. That world cannot stop us. Oh, it, it looked like it did. It looked like it had us. Sin looked like it defeated us. It looked like our faith was gone. But the one who conquered the world, conquered the unbelief in me, the one who overcame, kept me from falling, the one who did it. That's what Paul's telling us. He faced all of this. And all these things were more than conquerors to him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because they're all defeated. He defeated the world. And that means that whatever the world can invent, whatever the world can come up with, it's already defeated. It's already been overcome. And He gives His victory to you. He gives it to you. And how does He give that victory to you? He steps inside of your life and He lives. And that's the only reason we keep going. And we don't give up and we don't faint. Paul said to Timothy, he said, for which cause I suffer these things. Nevertheless, in the midst of suffering, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded. I'm absolutely convinced, unshaken, unwavering, that He, Jesus, is able to keep 
what I have committed to him against that day. And he gave him everything. And Paul had no worries. No fear. He had trials. But he had victory. Because he believed in him. So Jesus overcame this world and tells you to be of good cheer because he did it for you. You can't read Hebrews without seeing that he did this for you. And his victory becomes your victory. Because he did it for us. We were in him. And it's ours. You've borne the image of the earthly. But because Jesus is one, you will bear the image of the heavenly. It does not appear right now what you will be. But when you see him in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be like him. Because he has overcome. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. You are holy. You will be holy. Because he gives it to you. You are righteous. If you're trusting in him. And you will be righteous. And you will stand before the throne of the judge of all of the earth. And he will be there as your father. And he will look at you washed and redeemed in the blood of his son. And he will not find in you one thing that will drive you out of his presence. Because Jesus has overcome. You have been born from above. Because Jesus has overcome. He has glorified you. He has sanctified you. He has justified you. It's done. Have you sinned? He defeated it. He overcame it. And he'll put your sins away. Is the prince of this world attacking you? Jesus defeated him. He gives you his authority over him. You don't have to take it one more day. You don't have to take it one more moment. He's defeated. He's not powerless. Because if you give him power and authority, he'll take it. But if you will rise up in Christ, it can stop today. Is this world putting on you stress and worry? Jesus overcame it and he said to every one of his children now, I don't want you to live like the Gentiles live. They're worried about everything. They're worried about what they're going to eat. They're worried about what they're going to wear. They're worried about how they're going to live. They're worried about how they're going to pay their bills. They're worried about life. I don't want you to worry about any of that. I overcame that stress. I overcame that worry. I overcame the world's pressure to conform you to this image. I overcame it. And all I want you to do is seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. I'll take care of every one of those things for you. Every one of them, I'll take care of them. You don't have to worry about it anymore because I overcame it. This is the privilege that you have because you're in a unique relationship with me. If you're not in this relationship, you have to worry. Because you don't have the confidence that this God is going to provide for you. He'll be gracious to you and help you. But the promise is to his children who are seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. Is this world depressing and full of gloom? Well, Jesus overcame it. He said for you to set your affections above. Because if you look around here, it's nothing but sad news. Is it full of pain and heartache? Jesus has won for you a place where every tear will be wiped away. Does this place rob you of your loved ones through death? Jesus conquered that death and gives you a city where no one will ever die again. How wonderful he is to overcome. No wonder we have good cheer. And Jesus, it's not just these hopes. We just live any way that we want to live, do anything that we want to do, and now we can practice sin and all of that because Jesus did it all for us. I'd like to give you these scriptures as a word of caution so that we don't become frivolous with sin or toy with it. This first scripture is this, Know ye not that friendship, that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's James 4.4. You've got to be cautious because the world's constantly trying to distract you from God. Its pressure is relentless 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
And apart from the grace of God, the very powerful influence of a daily Savior and the power of God's Holy Spirit, this world will conform us to its image. But Jesus overcame this and gives us the victory of transformation. The Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ by whom I am crucified from this world and this world is crucified from me. It doesn't mean, you've you got to understand this because that verse has always been a little bit mysterious to people, but it doesn't mean that you just walk out there and you've got this bubble around you and the world hits it but it bounces off. It means the world that's in you. Because until you were born again, you were the world. This was your home. Its philosophy was your philosophy. Its way of life was your way of life. Its thoughts were your thoughts. Its goals were your goals. Its pressure was your pressure. It's all you saw. It's all you knew. And so you were the world. You were the worldly system. But now that you're born again, you have a new life in you. And that new life is not of this world. That new life is from above. You're born of God. You're a partaker of the divine nature of God. You're born of His Word. You're born from the Holy Spirit. And now you have within you a life that is heavenly, godly, holy, separate. But there is a tremendous conflict in your life. There is a battle that rages in you every day. And that is that old man that is of this world and that new man that is of God. And Paul said, there is a victory. And that victory is not my willpower, not my effort to put this down, not my, my strength to do what is right, but it is the cross of Jesus Christ that crucifies that world in me. He puts that world down every day or that world would take over me. And Paul said to the Romans, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself as your bodies, as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing your mind. He gives you the power of transformation. He gives you the power to not just have confessions, but to have a reality of life that you are born again. God does live in you. This world is not my home. And I can pass through it in the midst of trials and tribulations. And like any of us, it can hit us and it can get us down, cause us to battle with depression and gloom and doom and everything else. But because Jesus overcame, I can set my affections above. Because Jesus has overcome, I have something to do with my sins and they can be washed away. I have a God that I can go to anywhere, anytime, any moment when I come through His Son, through His precious blood, and receive mercy and victory over everything this world is trying to do. This world has a power, but that prince has been confronted, he has been dealt with, and he has been defeated by Jesus Christ. He has given us that victory, and we can walk in it, and we can live in it. I want you to stand with me. I'd like to just read a couple of comments from something Tozer said. And I just want us to pray this morning. I, I, I pray that whatever influence this world is having upon you, that you would have victory over it in Jesus' name. I pray that you would understand just what Jesus said. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've overcome it. What are you dealing with today? I promise you that whatever you're wrestling with is a worldly system whether it's in your personal life, from the attacks of the enemy against you, Jesus overcame it. He's overcome. He gives you the victory. <clears throat> Tozer said, When God works a miracle within the human breast, heaven becomes the Christian's home immediately. And he is drawn to it as the bird is drawn in the springtime to fly north. There's a migratory instinct within the breast of the bird. He doesn't know why. But along about March, he suddenly begins to look around and feels dissatisfied. He flaps his wings a bit and finally takes to the air and fans the cool breezes long and far until he goes back to what, his summer, what is his summer homeland. The Christian has a homeland, and the fact that we are not anticipating it and looking forward to it with any pleasure 
is a serious mark that something is very wrong with us. It is unbelief that pre- prevents our minds from soaring into the celestial city and walking by faith with God across the golden streets. It is unbelief that keeps us narrowly tied down here, looking eagerly and anxiously to the newspaper ads to see who is going to come and preach to us and keep our spirits cheered up. Remember, you are on earth and God is in heaven. So don't be afraid to dream high spiritual dreams. And don't be afraid to read your Bible and believe it. Soar as high as you can with your Christian hope. Let it spread its wings and soar heavenward. And when it has soared as high as it can go, God will smile still higher and say, come on up. Come on up. I just pray that the world's pressure to squeeze us down would lose its effect and that we would come to the very presence of God this morning, worshiping Him around His throne, rejoicing in a God. Now think about this, guys. Rejoicing in a God who, for you, overcame this world. He did it for you. And now you have a great high priest who is behind the veil with God talking about you in terms of mercy and grace. And this God who is talking to His Son, you've got to get this or there'll be no reality. This God, the majesty of heaven, has sitting beside Him, your high priest, They're talking about you. Individual you. Your problems. Your fears. Your weaknesses. Your sins. They're talking about you. And the invitation is, come. Come into this presence. Because God wants to give you grace and mercy to help you right now in your time of need. Because Jesus has overcome. How foolish it would be for us to not take advantage of that invitation and come to a God who right now is talking mercifully, kindly about you, wanting to help you.